can uh, move to the second round table. So please, uh, all the speakers and moderators. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone, and thank you so much for being here today. We are now moving to the second round table, which is about NFT and the metaverse. My name is Nancy. I am a core member here at Blockchain HEC and also a free series student at uh, HEC doing mastering management. And today here uh, with my co-moderator, Maxine, we're gonna go start with the round table. Today, we're very honored to have four experts on the topic to talk about the fascinating topic of decentralization and how enterprises leverage these new trends. First, please give a round of applause for our uh, speakers and let them introduce themselves uh, a really short introduction, please. I already made an introduction like a few, one hour ago. So I'm putting that on Calfon. I'm a partner and I run the Web3 crypto space for PwC France and Maghreb. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Pierre. I'm uh, one of the co-founders of Exclusible. So we're a Web3 and Metaverse platform. Uh, we started as a distributor of NFT collections made in partnership with luxury brands. And we've been progressively evolving and expanding, including towards Metaverse to take up towards the objective of helping brands and companies use Web3 and Metaverse as part of a new marketing channel. So we provide them with tools to you know, nurture, create communities, have communities meet in metaverse, everything around that. Hello everyone. Uh, I think you know me. Uh, some know me uh, as uh, as working uh, to the blockchain as you said before. So thank you all for the organization. Um, I'm David Prince. I'm the CEO of Binance. Uh, Michael Amon, I'm the co-founder of the Paris Blockchain Week that we were going to have next March at the Louvre Museum, and I'm an active investor in uh, Web3 specifically on infrastructure and tools. Hey everyone, so thank you very much for being here tonight. Uh, I'm Maxime Amonique, I'm graduated from HEC in 2017, and I'm the co-founder of a, a physically backed token platform for wine and spirits. So very excited to, to have a, amazing speakers uh, about this uh, topic about NFTs, metaverse, gaming, decentralization, and beyond blockchain tonight. So we talked a lot about DeFi at the previous round table. Uh, I'd like to mention that DeFi really kicked in in 2020 during the summer of DeFi. And then it was during a bear market and then so a bull market. Whereas for NFTs, Metaverse, it actually started more or less during a bull market and then started to, to feel what is a bear market. So we've seen how DeFi came so far during those uh, couple of years. So we've just, um, insight now could you let us know what you experienced in 2022 in such a particular year uh, in in uh, your perspective in uh, metaverse in gaming in, in nfts and so on so maybe you know, if you believe so i would say that we have i mean we're working with you know traditional companies and more pure players what i see i mean my my client's pipe is just booming for traditional companies especially in france and you mentioned there is the gaming company, but there are all the luxury brands. They're very interested because they see all the opportunities to engage new types of communities, new types of experiences, and they don't care about cryptocurrencies. So they're not so much interested. What they're very interested in is just all the new types of experience they can do and they want, and they also are very interested in doing it in the right way. So it's very complex because we talk about NFT but there are lots of confusion. Sometimes it's just mostly utility token that people talk because they don't understand the differences and they call that NFT. But depending of the type of use cases, depending of the type of technology there is behind, it's very much you, you know, case by case approach. And they want to understand you know, in which world they, 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 they are coming in. But the appetite, has never been so high. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I think I think my experience is uh, is not so different actually. Yeah, indeed, and uh, working with brands, especially indeed, the level of interest is is still super strong, which is actually quite a stark contrast with the other people in the room, which are you not know, the retail, the the holders, the collectors, uh, the people who bought you know, the JPEGs uh, during the the first half of 2022. I think those people have been feeling for sure the the change of atmosphere towards a, a bear market for the, the yeah second half of 2022 more or less basically. The sale of the other side, other side, sorry, lands kind of marked the top, and the, the it's been a, a, 
uh, downhill road since then. Um, so I think everyone in the, the market has been kind of reacting with different levels of speed to this change of paradigm. Uh, I think we're, we're an illustration of this, right? We started as selling NFTs, right? Distributor with luxury brands. And now those same brands are telling us uh, for right reasons, we don't want to sell NFTs anymore. We still want to use NFTs. We still very much believe in this space and the value it will bring and the fact it will become you know, core in our marketing strategy in the future, but selling NFTs you know, just, just won't work, right? So new use cases, new ways of doing business around this. So that's, yeah, that's, I guess, my story of 2022. Great year, 2022. We, we got to, uh, to a market that goes to uh, Bull to Beer, going uh, with, uh, with the crash of uh, multiple protocol of big size. Uh, I would say that what we learned is that you're never too big to not, enfin, too big to fail doesn't exist. And uh, also uh, for Binance, uh, the year of maturity uh, with the registration, uh, beginning of uh, going from a, from a startup to the institution institutional uh, um, um, platform and uh, and going still in this direction yeah i agree with most of what has been said but for the sake of the debate i will disagree <laughs> um on one thing um what we're seeing now from brands they've been working on for the next nine months so when they decided to jump in the wagon it was a, a bull market and it was everywhere so will they take the same decision now i think we're going to see it in six to nine months from now and that's to build yeah, we will know the how how deep is the is the bear market uh, just by this information. But if I may, on what you said, probably the type of use cases have changed a little bit. Like we're working from with brands, they're using all the NFTs approach to just build like the CRM new version, especially when they don't have the selling points, so they don't know exactly who are their customers, or because they're very interested in a secondhand also market. So those kind of use cases are very interesting for them and they just don't care about what's happening on the yes. on it. So probably the initial use cases that you mentioned and say they don't want to make it so but the underlying the underlying question is how many of the people in the active wallet that were buying NFTs were just doing it for speculation or things that are not really related to the brand. If it's, I don't know the number of course, but if it's 80%, we have an issue with the market because the brands, even if they do things um, that are, you know, not for commercial reasons, they won't have enough users. The few millions or hundreds of millions of people, question. I'd like to rebound on, on this uh, insight, actually. Maybe uh, starting with two misconceptions that we could, uh, we could uh, try to clarify tonight is that a lot of people think that NFTs are uh, decentralized, whereas actually a lot of their data, the metadata, are still very much centralized in centralized database. And a second misconception is maybe about the fact that NFTs can actually be dynamic, can change. That's why sometimes on a marketplace, you have this refresh button to refresh your metadata. So with this in mind, uh, what's, your, what's your opinion with uh, the usage of the NFTs for, by brands regarding decentralization? Uh, does it really matter to generate value at this stage from the brand for institutions and still PFP projects? Uh, happy to start with this one. Um, so I think this, this precisely on this question, I read something very interesting on Twitter this morning about the fact that some, some collections of NFTs having been distributed on FTX own NFT marketplace had their metadata and assets stored on, you know, AWS kind of, you know, centralized uh, database. So Right now, when you want to look at those metadata, what you find is like you know, legal notice about the fact that the company is, you know, is, being, uh, is, is, is bankrupt, which wouldn't happen if you had used like IPFS or are we any other kind of decentralized um, uh, storage system. Um, so of course, are is not blockchain itself, but still a good kind of illustration of, yeah, let's say dangers of, of, uh, of centralization and, uh, and best practices you should follow as a, as a project to use those um, decentralized storage infrastructure. And I guess it's also maybe a broader point towards, I think, progressive education of the public about the value of having things stored on chain. Not everything, of course, but at least some things matter and sh have value being stored on chain. Uh, right now, it's maybe kind of a niche interest, but I think it will broaden people liking some NFT collections because they know everything sits on chain. Like, you know, the CryptoPunks, the uh, Autoglyph, like some collections, everything is completely on chain. 
and I think it will, it will gain value in, uh, in awareness over time. My opinion, I, uh, I'm not up for uh, a lot of uh, decentralization on, uh, on the marketplace. Uh, for me, the main problem of NFT right now is the marketplace and the new dynamism of the marketplace. So that's where I would see uh, the most evolution or the most solution, uh, where the solution uh, is, in a way. For me, we are going to go from one generation of NFT to another in terms of usage, in terms of what, we, what it is, what we can expect, etc. Uh, last time, NFT was just a, a poster. Uh, then it became a, a, a way for creators to diversify their revenue, uh, a way for fans to become to the same community. Normally, we are going to have a next generation of NFT in the next iteration. Something very different. It could from uh, POAP to pool ticketing to anything else, to traceability to, uh, to a lot of things, but I don't know which one is going to be the first one. I agree, and that will perhaps drive the next bull market. Switch gears a little bit. Um, we're going to talk about brands and Web3. So the question is, what are the key things of Web3 brand managers should consider for their business? Please talk about, say, your favorite project executed by major brands, the common mistakes that brands make in Web3, and how do you see brands leveraging Web3 in five years down the road? Um, I like the Adidas one, right? Um, so it's a pretty wide one. So I like the story of it also. So what they did first is just to buy a board ape, but it was not just a single thing. They bought a board ape and all the community of uh, yoga and the board apes started following them. So with the Web3 move, they actually got a lot of Web2 users. I mean, millions of users just coming in because it was like for the people who are really living on crypto native, it's like the future. They're completely addicted to it. They're maximalist of this vision. And if a brand does it, um, it's huge because I can convince you, I can convince 10, 20, 50 people perhaps, but a, a brand like Adidas can convince millions of people and make them onboard. Um, so just by doing that, they already got the community behind them. Then they did a drop to a community that was already in love. And when I mean in love, I saw a tweet that was, hey, I've been a heavy Nike fan all my life, but now Adidas, you got me. Just the tweet I think paid off for the, for the world ape, right? And then they did the drop to this exclusive community. It went like wildfire, it did 100 million. And at Adidas, when it was a pet project, but when you cross the 1 million, 100 million, then you go directly to the board of directors. And from now, there is over 20 projects at Adidas that are working on Web3 and they're working on this uh, metaverse and exclusive uh, fashion brands only for holders. Um, so we're talking about community, but we're talking about something for those of us that have been on Web2. We were chasing emails, right? It was the most important thing for a marketer because it was the most, uh, the, the, the less expensive medium to reach out to your customers. And the new email is the wallet. And for now, it's pretty easy to get wallets, right? And five years from now, there's going to be huge competition to get users' wallet. Yeah. So if people move now, like I just did, you're basically acquiring emails for nothing. Um, right. So it's uh, not too late, obviously. It's still even early. But the, the race to the wallets is going to be uh, pretty uh, strong. What are the, the projects we like and the one, the mistakes that we see also? We saw lots of brands that, we, you know, they jumped into the opportunity exactly like a few years ago when you just wanted to have your own blockchain project and you could have their headlines. And we saw some, some brands doing some, some kind of recruitment, not necessarily with the right codes uh, on, the, on the metaverse. We saw some brands that didn't really understand what was different in the metaverse compared to virtual reality. So I think the good projects are the one where you try to have something different. And I'm thinking we all think about the brands in luxury retail, but there is this, this bank in South Africa. They wanted to renew completely the type of discussions they had with the young generation, you know, you know, who is the provider of um, financial services advice for the young professionals? TikTok. Do you know the level of accuracy of the advice that are provided by TikTok? <laughs> very low, very low. So what's very interesting is that they wanted to reach out to this new type of community, trying to test things in a very humble way. And I think 
The good thing is when you test on very humble way, trying to provide some, some, some advices, some with the gaming codes that I think are the good, the good, the good experiences. My perspective on this. Um, uh, so I, I love also what Alias has been doing. I think there are a few that have really nailed it. Uh, I really like what Tiffany has done. Uh, so for those who aren't familiar, they targeted a specific community, which is the CryptoPunks. So kind of historic um, collection, making available to hold certain holders of the of the, the CryptoPunks a limited edition pendant uh, by, by Tiffany, replicating how your CryptoPunk looks like. So it's like as a holder, I know I have something exclusive. So there's value. You give me a, a, an item that's unique. Again, value. You give me an item that's unique, exclusive, and that reflects a CryptoPunk that I own. And being it a very expensive profile picture, there's a high chance I, I show it on Twitter, on Discord. So it's now become kind of part of my, of my identity, right? So you can bet there's a high level of conversion if you speak directly to you know, my true self expressed through a, through a PFP. So I think everything that kind of ticks the boxes and it's, it's sold out pretty rapidly at a very like, insanely high price despite the bear market. So for me, it ticks all the boxes and maybe good experiences without naming names. Uh, I think brands that take it as an opportunity to make a quick buck without a strong commitment to the space that don't want to can like really build a community. Basically, I think community is the key word here. If you want to make a sale, it's, it's going to be hard in this market. If you want like to genuinely bring something to the space, bring like create a community, build it over time, maybe not monetize it right away, but actually you know, kind of bring value and then you will get something in return maybe down the line. That's why I actually like free mints done by brands the right way. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my, my perspective on it. Um, maybe to, to, to rebound on this again, maybe Michael with Paris Blockchain Week, we talked about how to educate and to welcome those brands. And I, I know you've been also attending a, a Basel fairs uh, where uh, Bezos has been actually organizing a lot of talks and NFTs got introduced uh, little by little during the fair in Hong Kong, then in, in Paris recently, and in Miami. Uh, so how do you actually um, onboard them? How do you, how do you actually make sure that the Web3 world accept them in, in the fair? Uh, how does it look like? Maybe we can talk about also an exclusive, or how does it actually take? Yeah, it, it's interesting. So, so in Miami, you have the conjunction in two, two, two weeks. I had a very schizophrenic week, actually. The first start of the week was going to the conferences. And actually, there were very low, low, very few people, very few sponsors, uh, very few speakers. They were very sad if you compare to last year because basically the, the crisis uh, came in. Um, then I went to the experiences made by brands, and it was totally different ball game. Right? So there was two blocks in Miami uh, downtown that were locked with uh, perhaps fifteen galleries, and a lot of brands have taken over uh, the gallery and just displaying art right and pitching their their concept their brand and their innovation centers usually all labs um so they were in they were motivated how do you onboard is that true? but i think there is too much tension it's like the crypto native guy i say oh you're a web one web two trad five don't talk to me you're centralized don't talk to me and if i'm going to a conference or if i meet someone like david and try to convince him about web three He's already convinced and he can try to convince me I'm already convinced and then if we stay like this we're going to stay with 25 million water and it's not going to work our common vision will not happen if we just you know uh, some kids on a playground so to get to the mass market we need uh, the corporates we need the brands and we need also tech giants um, because I mean a lot of people are not happy that Meta is coming to the place but you know we have 25 million wallets uh, they will do like this with their NFT project that will have 400 million wallets or perhaps 2 billion one day and perhaps okay it's centralized but once people would have tried the wallet would have bought an ft with with meta they will be able to buy it and un decentralized uh, so i think we need to reconcile so it's what we try to do and it's very strong nfts are dead so i'm i'm buying nfts still i'm very heavy on it i'm investing in the NFT technologies but it's dead because the world doesn't represent the experience that we are living and what we're building is a new web. It's not new NFTs, right? So at, at the conference, we used to call it uh, Paris NFT Day. And now we've just rebranded this week to Web3 Experience because it needs to englobe more than it's just a non-fungible token, right? It's more than that. It's decentralization. 
Um, it's uh, making it more fair for the cons consumer in terms of the consumer versus uh, the company relationship. Um, it's all it's all about you know DAOs, uh, DeFi, and not just a single PFP concept. So if working hand in hand with the corporates, with the brands, we explain the tools, then we'll have the mass market following us. Let's go back to regulation. Um, a key aspect of Web3 is the changing power dynamics and the, it's a shift of power to the users. And that really allows users to control the data. So I'd like to ask Pauline, what are the existing technologies that give users control and what are some future developments in the space? Um, so that comes back to the discussion around centralization and decentralization. Actually, there are different uh, different type of technology tools that exist and that not that are not, by the way, specific to Web three. I'm thinking obviously about encryption, about anonymization, pseudonymization that we have more, by the way, on the blockchain. All the pres preserving. Uh, um, uh, the, the privacy pre preserving uh, uh, data mining, all the access control, uh, all the privacy enhanced brothers. So there's lots of uh, actually tools that are that already uh, that are already in place. And when it comes to Web three, this is where we have all the specific uh, specific technologies that give us really the control of our data in the Web three space. These are the um, the app or the decentralized identity, uh, uh, which is possible, the self sovereignty uh, identity. Um, I'm thinking also about, uh, obviously, and we, we talked a lot about it, but DeFi, decentralized the data market. And what we are saying is that it goes at different paces on, the, on those different tools and technologies. But first of all, there is no, and we, we have some uh, some lawyers that are here. It is possible to have data privacy by design. There, it's just that it has to be done by design, first thing. And we see some uh, initiatives that are very interesting. I'm thinking of what's happening in uh, within South Korea around identity to enable you know the users to really have access to their identity. So there are many different type of tools, approaches that exist. And um, the thing is just to, uh, I think there is too, too much of opposition of what is possible by law, what is not possible. It's sometimes it's only, it's not so simple, but it's often also a, a matter of thinking about it by design. South Korea is interesting, I think. First, law is a moving object. It evolves. Law evolves with innovation. And uh, innovation drives law and regulation. So I think it's uh, what will be possible with law in the future is uh, really the question. Second point, I, I, took, I strongly agree with you on the identity. Um, data, I mean, uh, guys, we already know what you do with your iPhone. We already know where you are. We already know what you type. We already know everything about your life. So your data doesn't is not worth that much when we see the advertising model of everything. What is interesting is making data unique and what is more important for someone than the unicity of his identity. And right now, you know, there's a worst experience than paying in internet. The, the worst experience in internet is to prove that you are yourself or to prove that you are unique. Uh, and it goes uh, alongside a lot of different uh, companies. Uh, your bank uh, need your identity to open your bank account online. Uh, when you play a video game, it would be good that you have your identity link in order to have less cheater, less toxicity uh, in forum, etc. If you want to remove anonymity, you're going to need identity to make that. Uh, when you uh, use a software and you want to do an airdrop in crypto, uh, basically uh, the main key the, the, the main point that prevent MetaMask to airdrop his token that he wants to airdrop is that there is largely too much wallet 
uh, that have been created and they would need a unique identity per wallet to make an airdrop. So for me, the, 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 the next uh, and really uh, the next uh, use case about data privacy is the way to display the identity online, but also proving your identity with less parameter. Mm -hmm. In some websites that I never go, you need to prove that you are 18 plus. And maybe I don't want to give my name. Mm -hmm. I don't need to show all the detail of my identity to prove that I'm 18 plus. And it goes uh, for many other use cases. So, 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 and, and uh, rule 43, uh, if there is an innovation, it exists on porn. Very interesting. Um, so I didn't really plan to talk about uh, ZK rollup or zero knowledge proof, but maybe we could talk a little bit about that, how to actually uh, get verified, show you, showcase your identity without showcasing whatever you have in your wallet. Uh, so you basically show a little bit as input, then there is a little mix up algorithm and then you have your result so you can pass the KYC check and so on. Maybe we could talk about the future of marketplaces, David, since- uh, Yes, Michael, uh, what you want. <laughs> <laughs> with, with this technology. And also another thing I wanted to point out is uh, the change, the new trend of lowering or, or deleting royalties also with, with some NFTs on some marketplaces. So do you have also uh, um, an opinion about the uh, the future of business models of marketplaces in this case? Uh, yeah, so I cannot answer on Zeki, Zeki rollups, not my, uh, not my, uh, my, my area, but uh, on, the, on the marketplace side, a uh, few thoughts, because indeed the, the, the royalties issue has been, has been a very kind of uh, heated discussion uh, over the past few months with some new platforms showing up and just disregarding that what was until then, kind of a social consensus since the you know, since 2020 and the progressive emergence of uh, of NFTs, um, and I think what we'll see is, and especially now that OpenSea is trying to fix this, but by bringing more centralization into the equation, basically saying you know if you use our smart contract, you know you can operate on on our on our platform. We know we are the biggest one, so we kind of protect you, we protect your income, you creator, but we we create this you know, centralized entity, which of course is completely an antithetic to the spirit of Web3. So it, there's like lots of people trying to figure out what to do, people being opportunistic and just saying, hey, let's launch a platform, zero fees, uh, zero royalties and come, come, come traders. So I think it will, it will always boil down to social consensus. Again, if you look at what's happening among communities, uh, especially on the art side, art collectors, art blocks, that kind of communities. Those are people that strongly respect the, wo the work of the creators and the artists, and they will you know, very often completely refuse to use a, a platform that doesn't respect royalties. So I think we'll see new smaller marketplaces maybe existing to cater to the specific needs of this community. Other, market, uh, other platforms like you can think of uh, SudoSwap, mostly for traders treating, you know, NFTs are kind of, uh, you know, altcoins, the pictures. Um, and maybe something in between, right? But I'm probably going to be a different landscape than OpenSea being the, the one guy swallowing or the whole, uh, the whole market. That would be my guess. Thank you. Now we can open up for Q&A from the audience. Sorry, I left my voice too. <laughs> and the door open. So um, we often talk about core values in the space. Core values is not just a pretty ethical word. It's because it adds value to the actual product. Centralization, it's an added value. Uh, protection, securization, it's an added value. Um, you were talking about the shift in the markets that were bringing corporates in. How um, in your day-to-day -day, um, professional lives do you put good practices to make them understand what they are? Maybe it's better for more voice. <laughs> I think David, when he started just to explain what is, a, um, what is the community, uh, blockchain at HEC talked about inclusion, diversity, I mean, these are also, I mean, ESG, you have the governments and the social in between. And that's, I think, one of the core values also of the, of the Web3. Interestingly, what I would maybe start with, corporates, they were very puzzled about environment. I mean, it was like the number first question every time when they wanted to enter the Web3. And I think <laughs> things, but it was 
I mean, it really was the question because it, 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 they couldn't go for a project if, if it was. And by the way, in some of the NFTs projects that were launched, sometimes it was in things for environment, but when you were looking at how it was done, it was. But first of all, I think the community, the blockchain community, is really taking this as seriously. And I'm not going to just to 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 re expose but the different type of consensus that exists the shift um, of this community but so the the environment you know the 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 the, the web three for the good is i think one of the core value and which we are seeing more and more secondly it's like sometimes like a jungle because it's not only that there are lots of new techs but with all the day hours and so on you also have some legal um some legal ways of structuring the text that are very different and sometimes when the corporate has an issue doesn't even know who they can you know discuss with so our role like pwc and some of the others that are here today it's really to help them better understand what are the risks giving them also sharing with them good practices and for example we are doing a lot regarding internal control and sharing because sometimes we see that i mean we have clients they bought like they bought uh, lamps on the on the, on the metaverse but they don't even know that they are not owning the land they don't know how to put this in the pnl because depending on how, how it was done so our role is really to give them guidance and they're very willing to receive this by the way, we have created a club uh, where we have all our clients and their share also. It's, it's all coming to the community. The best practices that they are implementing, good, and also the bad practices, because since this is new, it comes as much as the good practices, just to know what, what has been done in the way. Two things is um, you're a startup, you want to do an NFT. Now we understand everyone that we need to give a utility, but what utility do you have when you're a startup and you have nothing? So that's the issue, right? On the opposite side, the brands have something to give you. Private sales, discounts, whatever. The, the same thing they've been sending us. So it's it's basically working hand in hand and showing them how to build together and try to leverage. Um, that's, uh, <clears throat> sorry, I had another one. For me, uh, um, I have an approach different with the brands uh, in Binance, one of the biggest platform with the most user. Uh, every time there is a bull market, we are going to have a problem, which is not of marketing, but of scalability, to be sure that all the users can access to the platform, put their order. It's not a social plat media platform, meaning that, you know, in Facebook, when you put your status, five seconds later, it's published. The interval of time, you don't take care about this in uh, social media. In Binance, it's critical that everything is real time. Um, so with brands, I'm going to take a, a position that is totally different than all of you guys, which is not here to take the to take the biggest, but to take the more convinced. Meaning that the education work, I don't do it. Not my job. Don't have time to lose. Very lucky about that. Yeah. And so basically, we make king and queens prove to the people that didn't that were not convinced that they have to go. But we're not going to do the education exercise about it. It's a losing time. We've tried it with Web2 in France. It didn't work. We invented a word that was Uberization. And it was about this. And brand kind of understands this. Michael, did you find your second point? <laughs> yeah. So so I think what we try to do at Pest Bashing Week is really to, to make the conjunction of these of these three worlds. I would say the tech giants, the corporates, and the crypto natives. <laughs> and no really, um when you think about it, if we can give the message as a community to uh, the brands that it needs to be more fair, there's no reason I'm buying a t-shirt at 30 bucks, which costs perhaps 30 cents just because there is, I hope nobody, nobody's here from, from the swoosh, but because the, there's a swoosh on it, and I advertise for them, right? I pay something 10 times the price, and I make the advertisement, and what do I get? Just a t-shirt. So this it needs to be more fair. I should, be I should get a fair compensation for the value I'm bringing to the table to the brand. And 
if everyone is expecting that from brands or at the, the, the first ones who will do that, the other ones will have to follow. It's like everybody's doing coupons, you don't do coupons, you're there. So I think the giving back and to involve the consumer and give him the fair share of its contribution is going to make what, what will be the, the change, uh, the shift for brands. Maybe also, Nana, just, just to add, um, so, you know, I mentioned we have a club, okay, with our clients and some, some of our clients are here. We're launching with an NGO. Um, We're launching an initiative to think of concrete solution on how Web3 can be a lever to achieve, you know, the 17 sustainable uh, development objective, Les ODD. And I think this is kind of interesting also just to have this work on trying to really think of what should we change and what is the opportunities that the Web3 represents to achieve those objectives that we all know by heart, but we are not very, you know, it's not very concrete. So it just shows you that there really are initiatives that are putting the core, I mean, the values in the center of, uh, of the Web3. <laughs> Indeed. The power of, uh, the power of, uh, of a cocktail. <laughs> of HSA, blockchain at HSA. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That, that would be a quick one. Um, have you ever thought, or probably have you come across in your practice, decentralized justice? Um, so have you probably thought about using like decentralized courts that sit in Web3 for your matters? It would be a nightmare for you to hear me tonight. This is one of the theme, because justice is, uh, is in the 17... Uh, uh, objective durable, the development durable. So this is one of the themes that we are going to. So we are only at the beginning. So to be really honest, but by the way, any one of you who is well is really welcome to work with us and with uh, with all the clients that we aggregate with this initiatives. And that's one of one of the theme, one of the core team. So I haven't seen it happen, but I've I've heard it being inscribed in like kind of terms and conditions. In the metadata like if you have like some kind of litigation in some cases for some projects there are certain conditions it can be resolved through cleros so the decentralized uh, uh, not justice uh, i don't know what i don't know what to call it exactly but so i don't i don't know if there's been a case happening but i know that somewhere someone is trying to you know, kind of put this in, uh, in practice not in justice right now because the legal framework i think is not ready yet legal is moving but uh, but this is very very soon and this is very very national uh, meaning that when you go to blockchain the first problem that you want to solve is a problem that you can solve globally problem of decentralized justice is that justice is unique per country. It's like IP, it's like uh, logistics, it's like many objects that basically on the ROI, I mean, you're gonna do something, but you're never gonna break even after, enfin, the, the, the cost to move one legal system, then one another, and then one another, uh, be brave. I hope you're not a startup if you go there, but maybe. It's going to work. Like you, you can create a, a, a technological justice. But then it's not going to be a justice that's going to apply in any jurisdiction. So that's where, you know, I have this a little bit of a problem. The more closer that me I experienced, and I don't have all the knowledge of the world, so maybe I'm uh, ignorant on this, uh, was on insurance, like a system of insurance on blockchain. Uh, where there is uh, people that put money uh, to uh, to covered, people that uh, get insurance, uh, some decision needed to be taken, uh, some um, projects that wanted to be insured, and then in order to be insured, they needed to pass a committee of evaluation inside. Uh, and it was, I would say, the more orchestral uh, way to do an administrative task that was not organized by the law. And when you try to organize by the law, then uh, you have a, a problem of scale, which I which I find very uh, very bad. Thank you. Uh, don't worry, I will me I will make it uh, really quick. Uh, I'm disappointed because I used the uh, Chat GPT to to create my speech, but uh, we won't have time. It's still it's uh, already late. Uh, I would like to thank all our speakers today.
uh, to have uh, done all the this presentation really interesting. Uh, thanks all of you to be there, and uh, it's really great to feel all this energy and this uh, growing uh, community. And uh, I hope we'll have a more uh, event like this uh, next year. Thanks, David, for the organization. It was really great. And now it's time to drink a little bit and let's go to cocktail and network. Thank you, everyone.